Oh, I, I put together some, uh, some slides on antipsychotics. I think a lot of it is going to be stuff that you already know from, uh, from medical school probably. Uh, I was hoping that we can just use this as sort of a base to, you know, to get more questions or uh, comments or any more thoughts about antipsychotics. So this is what we'll uh, go over in, you know, in the next 40, 45 minutes. We'll go over the nomenclature. What, is the, what are the indications for antipsychotics? And our, our rough mechanism of action. What is, uh, how do you measure efficacy in schizophrenia? Uh, how second generation antipsychotics are used as mood stabilizers. A little bit about antipsychotic polypharmacy. You'll see a good deal of that. And uh, finally, side effects and their management. So what do I really mean by nomenclature? So you know that antipsychotics are known by like a variety of names, right? Uh, they used to be called major tranquilizers or major at ataractics. Um, that's, that's kind of outdated right now. Uh, they've also been, uh, they've also called neuroleptics. Um, and most recently, they're called antipsychotic medications. I, I tend to prefer the word neuroleptics just because um, they are the most accurate representation of the effect of these medications. Antipsychotics implies that we know, uh, you know, we know the pathophysiology of psychosis very accurately, like, you know, like we may know the um, etiology of an infection and we are treating. So it's like antipsychotics, like antibiotics, but that's just not true. So um, uh, that being said, antipsychotics is the most commonly used term and that's what we use in this presentation. All right, so now you, I'm sure you already know that the antipsychotics are divided into two uh, groups, the first generation antipsychotics and the second generations. The major difference is only in the um, in that the second generations uh, target a larger variety of receptors. Contrary to what people might believe, uh, there is really no difference in efficacy, even for negative symptoms. Uh, the main clinical difference is only in the side effect profile, right? You know, the first generations have a bigger neurological effect. Um, more neurological adverse effects, whereas second generations have more metabolic adverse effects. And the only exception to this in terms of efficacy is Clostridium, because it does have a special efficacy in what's called treatment resistance schizophrenia. Okay, so again, um, what are the commonest indications for using antipsychotics? Okay. Yeah. Did someone have a question or was that accidental? I think it may have been accidental. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I was happy for a minute there that there was a question. But, um, so some indications, the co most common indications are of course, as you know, primary psychotic disorders, um, affective disorders like mania or depression when psychotic features appear in that context. Second generation antipsychotics are also used as mood stabilizers in people who have bipolar disorder. They're used in certain types of personality disorders like borderline personality when patients may have transient psychotic symptoms. They can be used as augmentation and now even as monotherapy for certain types of depression. They're used as augmentation for OCD. Behavioral symptoms that appear in the context of intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorders, dementia, small, very low doses of antipsychotics are used in delirium. And of course, rapid tranquilization uh, when people are, when patients might get very aggressive in emergency settings. Okay. So moving on to the mechanism of action, I just wanna add the caveat that the mechanism is not, uh, not perfectly known and the most common theory is that the antidopaminergic action and the D2 receptors is the therapeutic action that helps to control positive symptoms. And it's been shown that 60 to 80% of the D2 receptors need to be occupied to control the positive symptoms. Now, the second generations are a slightly different story. They mainly differ in two ways. 
Most of the second generations, except olanzapine, they dissociate quite rapidly from the D2, so they don't attach to the D2 and sit there for hours and hours. They uh, dissociate within a matter of minutes. And the second difference is that the second generations have an additional effect at the 5-HT2A serotonergic receptors, but this may not be related to antipsychotic action. It's not very, you know, it's not absolute. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of that. Here you see the number of minutes to detach from the clone, like this is experimental, so it's a cloned D2 receptor. So you'll see that the second generations, like ketiapine or seroquel, clozapine or clozarel, remoxipride, I have no idea what it's called in Europe. It's not used in this country, remoxipride and amisulpride. So uh, these two, these two drugs, ketiapine clozarel, dissociate quite rapidly from the D2 receptors. The medium, medium ones are olanzapine and certindole. Again, certindole is not used very commonly. They take a slightly longer, whereas haloperidol, raclopride, raclopride is you know, the molecule that's used for uh, receptor occupancy studies. So it's, uh, you have carbon labeled uh, raclopride that's used for dopamine, uh, dopamine receptor occupancy studies. So haloperidol, chlorpromazine, it's not a therapeutic molecule. Haloperidol and chlorpromazine, as you see, may occupy the D2 receptors for up to half an hour. Uh, again, this is <clears throat> this is uh, another representation of this of similar kind of data. This is the hours after the oral dose. As you see, haloperidol sets at the D2 receptors for for a longer period of time, whereas clozapine and ketiapine um, move away quite you know quite quickly. Start start leaving the D2 receptor quite quickly. And this point here might not be very relevant to you, but uh, it is very important for psychiatrists who are trying to discontinue antipsychotics. So uh, you want to, when you're discontinuing antipsychotics, you want to do it in a hyperbolic fashion or slowly uh, along this curve so people don't develop antipsychotic withdrawal syndromes. All right. So these are the three, this diagram is unnecessarily complicated. It just represents the same data again, that uh, there are drugs that, there are three main theories for the action of second generation antipsychotics. The first one being that they bind loosely at the D2 receptors. So they attach and they detach quickly. They have antagonism of both D2 as well as 5-HT2A receptors. And they might have some inverse agonist action at 5-HT2A receptors. All right, just three things to remember on how they're different from first generations. Uh, this is a diagram representing the various parts of the brain where antipsychotics act. So the main two main things that we need to remember here are the nitrostriatal pathway, which causes where the uh, uh, D2 antagonism causes, ends up causing the EPS, and the tuberoinfundibular pathway where D2 antagonism ends up causing hyperprolactinemia. All right, those are the two main and most clearly defined uh, pathways or side effects where antipsychotics can cause problems. Here are some of the intracellular actions of the antipsychotics, uh, in addition to you know, the downstream from downstream actions from D2 receptors. Uh, they can cause modulation of NMDA or glycine receptor actions. So uh, as you know, ketamine, which is an NMDA antagonist, ketamine is sometimes, ketamine induced brief psychosis is sometimes used as a model, as a laboratory model to test antipsychotic drugs or newer antipsychotic molecules. Um, induction of BDNF, nerve growth factor, this just implies that antipsychotics can promote neuroplasticity, phosphorylation, phosphorylation of receptors. If you remember, uh, phosphorylation can activate some receptors or it can inactivate some receptors. And it's supposed to also have some antioxidant actions. This is, this is interesting because um, when you measure you know, certain levels of oxidative stress in drug naive patients uh, with schizophrenia, they might be found to be higher and the, the levels of oxidative stress actually get reduced after the antipsychotics 
are started. But that can get contentious with some of the second generations because the second generations can cause increased blood sugar levels. And as you know, there is, you know, there is a relationship between um, blood sugar levels and oxidative stress as well. Both can increase together. So how do you actually measure uh, the efficacy of a drug in schizophrenia? Let's divide the, you know, let's divide the drugs and I mean, the symptoms into little groups. So, you know, the positive symptoms are delusions, hallucinations, and disorganization. And they are measured typically with these scales, uh, which you don't really need to remember unless you're going to look at randomized controlled trials. The most common negative symptoms are anhedonia, asociality, amotivation, elogia. These are again me measured by these scales. A variety of cognitive symptoms in schizophrenia, most prominently um, like executive dysfunction, um, reduction in verbal memory, um, information processing speed problems. So these are measured by batteries of cognitive tests. It has been shown, oh, I'll go on to that later. And then of course you have measures of suicide or aggression. And it has been shown that antipsychotics can improve positive symptoms. They have an effect on cognitive symptoms like verbal memory, as well as, uh, I'm not sure about executive dysfunction, verbal memory for sure, but they can actually slow the information processing. There are certain drugs like clozapine that have a specific action on suicidality in schizophrenia. So there is a clear uh, reduction of suicidal behavior when people are on clozapine as well as violence, but that is in, you know, state psychiatric uh, hospital settings. There are other real world outcomes that, you know, that are to be considered, such as uh, did the antipsychotic prevent hospitalizations? Did it prevent emergency room visits? What are some of the functional outcomes? Like what is the patient's quality of life when they're taking an antipsychotic? Are they able to sustain employment? Are they able to sustain relationships? Do they participate in their community? That's what I mean by citizenship. Does the antipsychotic reduce drug abuse concurrently? There is just evidence for clozeril that uh, it can cause a reduction in usage of uh, alcohol and nicotine. So this is, just, this is just a summary slide. So when you're looking at a drug and you're trying to figure out if this is what this might be right for your patient, then you want to see does this drug relieve acute positive symptoms of schizophrenia? Can it prevent a relapse and recurrence of positive symptoms? Can it reduce cognitive impairment? And finally, negative symptoms. And that's like the holy grail of psychiatry that's really never happened so far. Uh, is there a difference, a difference in the efficacy and effectiveness among the, uh, the various types of antipsychotics? Does it have, does the drug have an effect on the functioning of the patient? And is there anything to be recommended for, uh, you know, any specific effect in first episode patients? All right, uh, I'll stop here for a second if you have any questions, otherwise I'll just move on. All right, so let's let's just move on then. So this slide basically shows you what a mode stabilizer is. A mode stabilizer by a traditional definition is supposed to have these four effects, right? It's supposed to acutely treat mania. It's supposed to treat acute depression, as well as prevent a manic relapse and prevent a depressive relapse. There are not many drugs that fulfill this criteria except for probably lithium and uh, divalprox or Depakote. Uh, lemotrigine, which is commonly used as a mood stabilizer, doesn't necessarily fulfill these criteria because it's, it's, uh, it has almost no efficacy in uh, preventing manic relapses. But second generation antipsychotics, many of them are used to treat acute mania, like the slide shows, acute as well as maintenance treatment of mania. You'll see that all four of the all uh, four antipsychotics that were tried in this particular RCT showed some efficacy both in treatment as well as prevention of mania. This is a similar slide, but a different study by the same person. 
that also shows efficacy of antipsychotics in uh, treating and preventing mania. And these are long-acting injectable antipsychotics used for maintenance of bipolar disorder. So these, obviously, you don't need to read any of these um, you know, papers, but this just shows that the evidence is pretty robust, that antipsychotics can function quite well as mood, stabilizer, uh, mood stabilizers. All right, these are, these are pretty much the same thing. These are all long, relatively long-term studies of long-acting second-generation antipsychotics used to uh, maintain remission in bipolar disorder. Okay, so I'm sure you've all encountered antipsychotic polypharmacy as well. Now, surprisingly, you see it quite a lot in clinical practice, but when you actually look for the evidence, it's quite, quite poor. It has been, however, it has been shown that polypharmacy increases the side effect burden, increases uh, such as EPS, increased need for anticholinergics like cogentin or uh, artane, more hyperprolactinemia, more sexual dysfunction, hypersalivation, <clears throat> cognitive impairment, as well as diabetes. Uh, the only drug which had showed some use when used as an augmenting agent was Bilify because or aripiprazole because it may reduce weight gain in some patients and it may reduce hyperprolactinemia and sexual dysfunction when used as an add-on agent. So I think the takeaway from this slide is the only agent that might have some use as an add-on antipsychotic is a Bilify. And if you're seeing a patient who, let's say, has hyperprolactinemia or sexual dysfunction due to, let's say, haloperidol or risperidone, Abilify might be an agent to actually treat that. Okay. okay. Uh, moving on to the adverse effects. Um, any questions at this point? None? Hi, uh, I'm Kiran, one of the PGY3s. Um, just a question: when, when you're using a Bilify like that, do you do you try and taper down the the like um, first antipsychotic as well, or do you is it like a just an add-on, like an extra agent that you're using? Absolutely, that's that's a good question. So anytime you have a side uh, adverse effect due to a particular drug, the first step is to reduce the dose of the offending agent, right? And there might be certain situations where that's not possible. So let's say someone developed hyperprolactinemia on, uh, and let's say gynecomastia on 10 milligrams of haloperidol, but every time you drop the dose from 10 to eight, this person's psychotic symptoms flare up. So dropping to eight milligrams is not an option. In that case, you may want to think about adding aripiprazole on, but uh, always the first step is to drop the dose of the offending agent especially Thank because you. hyperprolactinemia is a dose-related side effect. So uh, if you drop from 10 to 8, there's a, there's a chance that you know, the hyperprolactinemia might go away. Any, any other questions at this point? No? Okay. So in terms of the uh, adverse effects, we all know that the two major group of adverse effects with antipsychotics are the neurological problems and the metabolic, metabolic adverse effects. So I'm, I'm discussing only the major adverse effects here. There might be like a whole, you know, a whole list of smaller ones, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into that. So the neurological side effects are more common with the first generation antipsychotics, but, that, but they can also occur with the second generation antipsychotics. So I've divided them into two sections. One is the Symptoms that adverse effects that appear acutely, like within, let's say, the first four to six weeks of the patient taking the uh, antipsychotic and chronic or um, adverse effects that will appear after a patient has taken the antipsychotics for several months or several years. So uh, Parkinsonian symptoms, if how many of us are there here? Uh, is it about 30 of us, would you say? How many participants do we have? Uh, 43. Okay. Do you think we can all list one Parkinsonian side effect 
and still have room? No. No, probably not. So uh, would you like me to go on and describe uh, the Parkinsonian symptoms or does, I'm sure all of you know, so I'm sure one of you could do it quite well. What does it look like? Anyone care to take a stab at it? If you want to unmute yourselves or post in the chat, um, what you can have to describe the Parkinsonian symptoms you might see. Um, so Andrew Kim is saying resting tremor. Excellent. So resting tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity. Yes. So we got three. Wonderful. Looks like we might hit 44 or 43. Excellent. So you have uh, autonomic instability, micrographia, which is a manifestation of uh, bradykinesia. What else? What, what is the word for when you cannot speak very loudly because there's a rigidity in your vocal cord? Dystonia can occur, uh, but not as a primary feature of Parkinson's disease. It might pop up much later. Uh, and certainly not in drug-induced DPS. Hypophonia, there you go, that's right. Dysphonia and hypophonia. What else, did anyone say postural instability? Yes, someone said ataxia. Well, the word ataxia is technically, you know, associated with cerebellar um, toxicity rather than with extrapyramidal. But I get what you mean. I, I presume you mean um, yeah, postural instability. Okay, what does the gait look like? The classic gait for Parkinson's? Shuffling gait, exactly. And the textbook description is a person trying to catch their own center of gravity, slow turning, yep. What happens to the arm swing? Arm swing is reduced, yeah. Glabular tap, the glabular tap shows up. It's one of the frontal lobe signs. Okay, so good. So all of you know all the uh, signs and symptoms of Parkinson's, uh, a Parkinsonian syndrome. What is, the, uh, what is the type of tremor? Like what is the rate of the tremor? Is it a regular uh, movement or is it at rest or does it appear? On movement, is it a fine tremor, forced tremor, resting tremor? Yep. How many hertz, roughly? Five to six hertz. I would say slightly higher, more unilateral, more likely to be unilateral in idiopathic Parkinson's. Yes. Um, what else? So one interesting question pops up, you know, when our patients who have schizophrenia and who are taking who have taken antipsychotic for many years, they suddenly develop EPS. So it's very hard to tell whether this is an idiopathic Parkinson's disease popping up or is it a drug-induced uh, Parkinson, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinsonian syndrome. So what would you do to differentiate? Theoretically, what would you do to differentiate? You could stop the drug and see if the EPS goes away. Um, if you cannot stop the drug, if you had to do some fancy neuroimaging, what would you do? The neurologists like to do it and you know, they're occasionally they actually will do it too. So you image the D2 receptors in the nitrostriatal pathway and see what is happening with the D2 receptors. All right. Uh, okay, M moving on. Um, what does what does a dystonia look like? This is something you might even see in you know in the emergency room, or um, what is the typical muscle that gets involved in a dystonia? Classic. Sternocleidomastoid, exactly. 
So it causes torticollis. Uh, I would request you, if you guys are in the ER and if you see a dystonia, please treat it quickly. It's very painful, it's very scary. So, and we'll talk about how to treat it later on. What are the risk factors that someone might develop dystonia? Generally young men, because the muscle mass is higher, and if they have received first generation hypotensy antipsychotic, like haloperidol or fluofenacine. Okay. Uh, what about NMS? Clinical description of NMS, which you might see in the emergency room again. Fever, rigidity, delirium, autonomic instability. Yeah. What happens to the blood work? CPK, CPK MM of more than 10,000 very often. And person will give you a history of having received antipsychotics recently. Okay. Akathisia is another very, very common side effect. Uh, and it's very distressing. So you want to treat it quickly. What does akathisia look like? One. So akathisia is basically a subjective sense of restlessness. A patient might just report feeling that subjective sense, but sometimes it might be so obvious that they cannot even sit in your office. They keep walking up and down or they are marching in place. Very important to remember that akathisia has been correlated with suicide. So if, it, if you see it, treat it quickly and effectively. Uh, rabbit syndrome is very rare, but I put it in here just because it sounds fun. So it's a very fine perioral tremor. And, you know, when you look at rabbits and their noses and mouth, you see like a very fine tremor uh, around their mouth. So that's why it's called rabbit syndrome. Typically may pop up around six to eight months after starting the antipsychotic, but it's very rare. Tardive dyskinesia, which you have, I'm sure all of you have heard about, irregular sustained movements in either the extremities or the, or the trunk, uh, which can be, you know, very, uh, can be a big source of impairment in both social functioning and uh, at work. Tardive dystonia is a type of dystonia that can also show up after a person has taken an antipsychotic for many, many years. It's relatively rare. So the first step, uh, again, I'll, I'll emphasize that point again. So these side effects can be distressing. They can be sometimes very painful. So please treat them quickly. Um, you might even see them in the ER, like dystonia and akathisia. People might be distressed enough to go to the ER. So if it's an option, you want to stop the drug that's causing the problem, or at least lower the dose of the drug that's causing the side effect. Second, uh, your second step will be anticholinergic medications, you know, benzotropine, trihexafenadol. They can be used both intramuscularly as well as oral. Antihistamine anti drugs, basically to mobilize their anticholinergic effect, to use their anticholinergic effect, like Benadryl, diphenhydramine, or the most effective and uh, quick treatment are benzodiazepines. And this is one situation where you should not hesitate to use them because if, um, and I'm sure all of you know from your, um, from your board exams that um, the drug that's used to treat akathisia is propranolol and not anticholinergic agents, yeah. What about tardive dyskinesia? Uh, any, any of you? are familiar with how to treat artic dyskinesia, TD? No, so TD for a long time was also, you know, um, considered untreatable, but now there are a couple of drugs that have some, uh, uh, you know, have some efficacy in treating TD. One of them is actually Keppra. So there are three randomized control trials showing that Keppra can effectively treat TD. 
And the other one is valbenazine or Ingrazer. And uh, good luck to you if you're trying to get insurance to pay for Ingrazer. It's, it's near impossible. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Okay. NMS is straight up supportive care, making sure the patient is hydrated, making sure their body temperature is under control. And Daptrolene is not used very often, but it is obviously very effective in treating NMS. It blocks the release of calcium within the muscles. Okay, another problematic uh, side effect is hyperprolactinemia. And I think one of, uh, one of the less known points about hyperprolactinemia is that in the long term, it causes osteoporosis. And <clears throat> in older patients, they can get fractures because of this. So very important to remember in people who are aging and who are on antipsychotics, possibly also on a benzo. So the risk of falls and fractures shoots up because of that combination. And you know, if they're hypertensive and on an hypertens uh, antihypertensive agent, again, the risk of falls is pretty high. Uh, falls and subsequent fractures. So hyperprolactinemia is really, really distressing because it causes erectile dysfunction, causes gynecomastia and galactoria. Uh, I know there's a, there was a class action suit against uh, Janssen because risperidone had caused um, gynecomastia in several young men. And, and that's, that's a huge problem, especially for the younger Younger men, it's embarrassing. It interferes with having a relationship. So uh, hyperprolactinemia is clearly dose-related. It responds to lowering of the antipsychotic agent. But if the dose cannot be lowered, then you might want to consider uh, adding Embelify as a treatment. And if someone develops severe gynecomastia, sometimes like even surgical intervention is, is needed. Okay, so. I'm not going to list all the anticholinergic adverse effects here. You already know that, like dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, biliary colic, and whatnot. It's more likely to occur with lower potency first generation antipsychotics like chlorpromazine. And the best way to treat this again is by lowering the dose. Okay. Metabolic side effects, very important because nowadays we use second generations way more frequently. Weight gain appears almost instantly with some of these drugs like olanzapine. If a patient doesn't develop weight gain in the first four to six weeks, I, I often end up suspecting that they're not taking the olanzapine. It can be that reliable an indicator of, you know, uh, of uh, adherence to the drug. Uh, it causes, it can cause uh, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia, frank diabetes. There are several case reports of patients who were started on olanzapine and the, they just showed up in the emergency room with diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, whether this side effect is dose related or not is pretty controversial. Uh, there are, there's a bunch of studies that say that even if you drop the antipsychotic to the lower dose, lowest dose possible, there is no change in the metabolic adverse effects. But, and there are some studies that say that there is some benefit to reducing the dose. And again, we don't know that um, the dose window in which that relationship holds true. Okay. Then of course, there's a group of drug specific adverse effects like you know, clozapine can cause agranulocytosis, Abelify is under scrutiny right now for causing impulse control disorders, including gambling. It's a very um, strange little class action suit where uh, you know lawyers are going around soliciting people who have taken Abelify and who have lost more than ten thousand dollars due to gambling. I don't know why they specifically decided on ten thousand dollars, but that's what it was. And with ketiapine, there are one or two case reports of cataract, and in the animal studies, they definitely caused um, cataracts and some retinal pigmentation in rodents, I believe. There are several more topics to be, uh, you know, to be discussed among, you know, within antipsychotics, like using long-acting antipsychotics, and uh, the one that's 
one that's like of most interest to me, which is how to paper antipsychotics. Um, but I don't know how useful that might be to you guys. So I'll stop here for now. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. If anyone has any questions, you guys can feel free to unmute yourselves um, or post in the chat as well. Stop the share. Uh, and I can, you know, if it helps, I can send you the slides. I'm happy to share it. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for a really um, useful talk for us. Of course, no, no problem. Uh, I can send you the slide set and you know, you all, you all have my email. So just feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, I'll put it in the chat box here. I'd be happy to, you know,